Professional women continue to face a unique set of challenges in the workforce, and it's imperative for women to know their leadership purpose and what makes them distinctive from their colleagues. Women must understand the influential factors present early in their lives that made them who they are today, and must learn to fiercely advocate for themselves and visualize the, their success for their entire career journey, especially later in life. So tonight we are joined by several esteemed alumni and faculty of NYU who are going to take a deep dive into some of these topics. It is my honor to introduce our panelists tonight. Dr. Natalia Sinius serves as Senior Vice President and Chief Nursing Executive and Co-Chair of the Equity and Access Council for New York City Health and Hospitals, the largest public health care system in the nation, which serves more than 1.4 million New Yorkers annually in more than 70 patient care locations. Dr. Maxine Feinberg is a periodontist and was the third woman to serve as president of the American Dental Association. Dr. Feinberg was the fourth district trustee to the ADA Board of Trustees and was the first woman to serve as president of the New Jersey Dental Association. Dr. Nisha Mehta is a radiologist with subspecialty training in musculoskeletal and breast imaging. She is also an international keynote speaker, a writer, and a physician advocate who focuses on issues related to life and medicine and the changing healthcare landscape. Eloise Cathcart is a clinical associate professor at the Rory Myers College of Nursing at New York University, where she directs the graduate program in nursing administration and leadership. This program was recently ranked in the top 10 in the nation by US News and World Report. I will, return the, I will turn the program over to Professor Cathcart, who will be serving as the moderator for this evening. Good evening. I would like to add my warm welcome to everyone who has joined us tonight for this most interesting program. It has been a wonderful opportunity to work with our three outstanding panelists in putting this program together. Natalia Sinius is a good friend of the Rory Myers College of Nursing, <clears throat> excuse me, and a frequent visitor to my classroom. So it's wonderful to see her again. And I have really enjoyed uh, meeting Maxine and Nisha and look forward to hearing from all of these three most interesting and accomplished healthcare leaders. We've structured the program to leave ample time to hear from each of you in our audience, our alumni, and for you to hear from each other. So to that end, we've asked each of our panelists to take the lead in answering a question and then have the other two add any essential points they'd like to make. But for the first question, we want you to hear more fully from each. The questions were derived from current topics in the leadership literature and have been shared with our panelists beforehand. I'm going to try to keep us on a schedule to allow for a robust discussion afterwards. So I apologize in advance for any interruption that I may make. So if to members of our audience, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the Q&A section on your Zoom screen and I and my colleagues will bring them into our conversation after our panelists have responded to the questions. So let's get started. So the first question uh, surrounds a topic that is really uh, prominent in um, any literature uh, around leadership, and it has to do with purpose. So purpose is increasingly recognized as the key to navigating the complex, volatile, ambiguous world we face today where strategy is ever-changing and few decisions are obviously right or wrong. Leadership experts believe that the process of articulating your purpose and finding the courage to live it is the single most important developmental task you can undertake as a leader. Your leadership purpose is who you are and what makes you distinctive. It's not what you do, rather it's how you do your job and why. The strengths and passions you bring to the table, no matter where you're seated. It's what everyone close to you recognizes as uniquely you and would miss if you were gone. 
So the question to all three of our panelists, and we'll start with Maxine, is how would you describe your purpose? How do you live it out with your patients, your colleagues, and within your organization, with your students, your mentees, so that if you weren't there, it would be missed? Well, I don't know if it would be missed, but I, I feel that, um, you know, for me, purpose is, is something that was established in my, um, my approach to life very early on. There's a concept um, in Hebrew, it's called tikam olam, and it means repair the world or construct and, and do good things in the world. So, you know, from the time I was very young, I always felt that um, I wanted to contribute to making uh, whatever I did better, whether it be for my patients. Um, you know, when I was a young dentist, uh, New Jersey has very poor statistics when it comes to water fluoridation. So I would go to meetings and say, why aren't we doing something? And say, oh, well, it's not gonna happen. We shouldn't, you know, we should just forget it. It's not gonna happen. And, you know, I'm persistent. I felt it was an important issue, something that deserved um, our attention. You know, I heard something, I saw something today on Instagram from the American College of Dentists, and it's a quote from, from Jesse Jackson. I think it's really appropriate. Time is neutral and does not change anything. Le with courage and um, initiative, leaders change things. So I have tried to be the leader that even when it's not popular, um, mm -hmm. even when the idea might seem foreign to others, um, I've always been willing to take that stance. Um, and I think that that's really an important thing that, that I have always felt compelled to stand up for what I think is right and to speak out whether it was popular or not. And for me, it's again, trying to make the world a better place for my patients, um, my colleagues, the young people entering my profession. And I think that that's what makes me who I am, the ability to say what has to be said, even if it isn't the most popular, um, you know, approach at the time. And very often with patients, and um, education, I've been able to convince others that, that there is merit to, to what I wanted to do. And that's, that I would say is, is my, my purpose, making the world a better place. Great, thank you very much. Nisha, let's go to you. What, how would you describe your purpose, that, that passion that fuels your work, that gives you energy? So I wish that I could say that I was like Maxine and say that I had known my purpose um, from, or, you know, had my my North Star, I guess, from the beginning. Um, but unfortunately, I, I think for me that it's actually been it really has been an evolution. I think I followed a very straight pathway in terms of what I was supposed to do. And those of you who know me from NYU may argue that I've always kind of you know, dance to the beat of my own drummer a little bit, but I always stayed within sort of the confines of what was expected for me and what was um, within the system. And I was always afraid to push it just a little too far. And I think um, it really took bigger things happening in my life for me to start learning that I needed to sort of stand up for what it was that I wanted from my career and like realize the fact that my career didn't have to be the same as the people whose portraits were in my med school hallways because I wasn't the same person that they were, right? And so it took me a long time. I think we in medicine in general spend a lot of time molding ourselves to what our role models show us or what we have this conventional wisdom of what success is defined by and whether that's publications or whether that is, you know, the most prestigious position within an academic medical center or whatever it is. And that was sort of the pathway that I thought that I was supposed to take. And every time I wanted to veer away from that, I would worry a little bit. So I remember when I was at NYU, um, my attendings were having their children for the, you know, like their first child at that time. And I had already been married for a few years and wanted to have my first child. And I remember that was like, Everybody was like, you're going to fail your boards. There's no way you can't have a child right now. And I was like, I really kind of want to have a child right now. Um, and so it took me a little bit of time to kind of say, hey, 
I really am going to do things the way that like fits into my life. And maybe the system is going to have to change to reflect me. Right. Um, and as I became a little bit more cavalier about that and talking a lot more about that and realizing that that message was resonating with a lot of people and finding that that was really something that needed to change about the system, my purpose became a lot more clear. So now, you know, every, every time I've had to make a major decision in my life, whether it's cutting back a little bit clinically to focus on other things or whether it's taking a job that, you know, may have been different from what I would have taken 10 years ago. Um, I've really had to examine what that why is. And I think I've come to the fact that my purpose is really to change the culture of medicine so that the concept of career longevity is emphasized and that we have a sustainable physician workforce. And that's something that I really felt was lacking in the early stages of my career. So in a healthcare landscape where burnout is so prevalent and so many healthcare workers are leaving medicine, we all have to put a lot of thought into what is gonna make us wanna do this for the next 10, 20 or 30 years. And I think for women, um, I don't know the statistics um, across like the different professional groups within medicine, but I know for women physicians, 50 or 40% of female physicians will actually cut back clinically or leave medicine entirely within their first six years of um, finishing training. And that is not sustainable, right? We've got a medical school population that is 50% female um, in terms of currently matriculated students. And you cannot have a sustainable physician workforce if people keep leaving the system. So at some point you need to ask yourself, what is wrong with that system um, that we're pushing people out from a career that they've spent three decades trying to get to? Um, and what can we do differently so that we make that a more welcoming place? And how do we change the culture of medicine such that the males are also our allies and say, hey, yes, this is something that we need to change if we want to be able to keep the best talent in medicine. Um, so I think that that really has become my passion is how do I build these communities so that people can talk to each other across specialty, across stage of practice, across gender, um, and see what everybody's unique challenges are and figure out what it is that we can do to support each other within this very complicated and sometimes soul crushing system um, such that people wanna do this for the next 30 years. So career longevity has really become my why um, amongst physicians. Thank you, Natalia. Tell us about you. Sure. So I would say a few points resonate that have been said already tonight, but I have to be honest. If you asked me this question 20 years ago, I probably would have said career. So what I'm doing is my purpose. And that's changed, um, particularly during the pandemic. I spent a lot of time thinking about being alive. Um, and what does that mean? So I think Today, to answer the question, I think my purpose goes beyond my career. Because if you think about it, for me at least, one day, hopefully, I will be healthy enough to retire. And I, and I hope to still have a purpose. Mm -hmm. And so I truly believe that my number one purpose is to be. And that is deep for me. For me, being means holistically being and being okay with taking up space and understanding that taking a breath and being alive is really a blessing and a privilege. And not to get too deep tonight, but, you know, I do believe that in being alive, I have to contribute to the human race and to society, which is what Maxine said, right? I have to, I have to contribute and I have to do something about it, about what concerns me. And so not only just being, contributing to society, but I think day to day, um, I've gotten to my purpose by feeling and really being in touch with what I love, what angers me, what annoys me, what I'm passionate about. I remember silencing myself in the hallways at New York University. And that's when I discovered that I wanted to go into nursing administration. I knew it. I can feel it. It was an intrinsic feeling. I, I knew that's my path. But nevertheless, there are moments along the way where I remember giving a patient a bed bath. And it was a patient who um, at first we you know, thought may have had maggots and was homeless. And I, for some reason, I connected with this patient. And I connected with the patient's skin. It was visceral, my response. And I remember telling my sister when I got home, there was something about the connection. There was something about helping this patient that felt different. 
And she said, for real? And I said, yeah. So along the way, I've been very in tune with how I feel. And as I led teams throughout the years, um, most recently, I realized that health equity is my purpose. And it's not just with this role. I think I'm very fortunate to lead the largest public health system in the United States, where we care for the largest uninsured in the country, et cetera. But I think it goes beyond my day-to-day -day role, where I am committed to advocating for those who cannot advocate for themselves. Um, and I hope when I do retire or I leave you know, this role, that individuals who either work with me will remember the fact that I've advocated, whether it's for patients, whether it's for staff, um, et cetera, and sort of who I am as a person, as a human being. But I think it goes beyond my day-to-day -day role. And you know, I am very proud of the work that we're doing to really execute the national agenda of nursing, which is focusing on health equity. Most recently, we wrote an article about the future of nursing, and we've executed every point in the future of nursing report, which will be published next month in the Nursing Administration Quarterly Journal. So I'm proud of the work, but I must say, I think my purpose is beyond my role. Wow. So three very interesting perspectives. So buckle up because we have a really, I'm sure, a very interesting conversation ahead. Thank you all. So for the next question, we're going to ask Natalia to take the lead. I am so sorry. Let me just stop this. Whoops. I'm trying really hard to keep time, but sometimes my phone is smarter than I am. Okay. So Natalia, if you would be kind enough to start us off on this next question that I'm going to read, and then Maxine and Nisha will add their perspective, and then that's how we'll, we'll do all the questions with each person leading a particular one. So this question has to do with um, how we learn the kind of leader that we can be. So Deborah Ancona, a professor at the MIT Sloan School of Management, and her colleague David Perkins, an executive coach, uh, recently published a piece in the January-February issue of the Harvard Business Review entitled Family Ghosts in the Executive Suite, where they say, quote, early in life, family dynamics give rise to many fundamental behaviors and attitudes toward authority, mastery, and identity. When similar dynamics emerge at work, people often revert to childhood patterns to deal with these fundamental components of relational work so that to achieve our greatest potential, we need to understand how these factors have helped make us who we are. Psychotherapist Esther Perel in her podcast, How's Work, tells us that each one of us has a relationship resume, a relationship dowry, she calls it, that is cultivated at home in our families, our communities, and our romantic lives that influences the way we interact with our colleagues at work and shapes our behavior about trust, loyalty, self-reliance, and communication. So our beliefs and our values about these things and our behaviors are deep-seated. So the question, Natalia, will ask you to start us off on this is, what did you learn about yourself early in your life from your family, your community, your culture that prepared you to be a leader? And what messages do you have to quiet and reframe in order to be successful? Thank you. So I do feel you bring your childhood self into the future, into who you are as um, an individual and as a professional. I am the youngest of six. As a child, I was allowed to explore and to imagine. And I think I continue to do the same thing in my role today. As a daughter of Haitian immigrants, you know, I watched my mother and my father work very hard and wake up very early, uh, which I do now, ironically, right? I work really hard, but I love what I do. Education was something that was not um, an option for my parents. So I think we've always been raised, my siblings and I, to take it very seriously. 
And I remember, you know, coming home with a 99 and my father would ask, where's the other point? Uh, so I think, you know, he's pretty tough on us because he realized, you know, the opportunity uh, that we had here. And we definitely took full advantage of that. So I think education continues to be something that I treasure uh, by, you know, recently obtaining my postdoctorate degree from uh, Case Western University. Uh, also, the fact that as uh, children, we were not allowed to argue, uh, which is really interesting. We had to get along. And so even in the workplace, when there are issues, you know, I often just uh, not engage in childhood behaviors because we were not allowed to do that as children. And I think uh, the most important thing that I was able to really carry over into my professional life is the fact that I was really given an, an amazing opportunity to create my own path. So there was zero influence from my parents in terms of who I should become. I remember my third grade play and I you know, had difficulty selecting whether I, I wanted to be a nurse or whether or not I wanted to be a teacher. And ironically today I'm both. You know, So I'm a nurse, but I also have been an adjunct professor at Columbia University for the past seven years. So I think the innovation, the exploration, and the structure that my parents provided continue today in my life. And I'm just so thankful uh, you know, for their support that continues to today. And what about the messages that you got that you sort of have to remind yourself to ha have them stay quiet? Yeah, that's still really hard. You know, um, just this week, someone told me that I reminded them of, you know, Kentonji Brown Jackson. And that was shocking uh, because I have to reserve myself sometimes in terms of what I'm thinking, even if I think the question makes no sense. Um, so I think at home, I learned the importance of deference, uh, you know, to really be poised and to really reflect before I speak. I think those are the lessons that allow me to really process things in the boardroom or at work, even if I'm thinking something completely different. But I think at home, I was really uh, essentially trained to do that and not to just lash out, but to really be diplomatic in my approach to things. And I think that's a lesson that has gone a long way. Great, thank you. Nisha, what are the things that were sort of instilled in you that help you be a great leader? And what are those things that you constantly have to quiet? Yeah, so I think it's probably the same thing that can be both a blessing and a curse for me. Um, there, so when I grew up, you know, and I, I identify totally with um, Natalia's comments about the 99 and the 100. In most South Asian families, it's not only why didn't you get the 100, it's where's the extra credit, right? So there's always these like undertones of achievement, but actually I didn't grow up with that as much. I saw it all around me, but in my family, it was a little bit of a unique situation because my brother actually has some really significant learning disabilities and some other physical like, um, and, and you know health issues and so the focus was always on him um, with my parents and just making sure and we had this huge family um, you know even though our immediate family was only four my dad was one of seven and my mom was one of five and they actually brought over each of their family members um, from India their brothers and sisters from India they were the first ones here and and then they lived with us for a few years and that meant that we were constantly sharing and there was always our resources kind of going either back to India or um, my dad paid for all of his brother's educations and um, you know they would all like he would buy them their first house he would get everybody settled um, and so on my side of things, there wasn't like a ton of attention put on what I was doing because all the attention was really put on making sure that my brother had everything that he needed and then all of these other people. And so it really allowed me actually to be really independent. And, you know, I'll be honest and say that like, unless I would have gotten pregnant or like flunked out of school, I don't think my parents really would have said a whole lot about my education. Um, and so I was always very self-directed. I think the, the thing about that is that I learned to be independent very early. Um, and I also feel like I learned very early on not to place a lot of value on a person's intelligence as the like determining factor for 
you know, their worth as a human being, right? Because I looked at everything that my brother brought through my life and that he brought to everyone around us. And, and that's something that I try to instill in my kids all the time now. And so my brother, actually, he just left today. He was staying with us for the past five months. And it's been really great for my kids to learn those lessons too, because I think we live in such a, like, you know, academic achievement oriented environment that's only perpetuated by these institutions by NYU and you know I was like Ivy League born and bred until then at Brown and Penn and um, so I was always sort of the one who who really kind of downplayed that stuff and really taught myself to look at kind of who the person was and what their positive traits were um, and I think that I really carry that into my leadership style because I think I understand that everybody's fighting a different battle um, and mm -hmm. You may not know what those battles are, but you got to assume that they're there under the surface. And everyone I talk to, I mean, I now lead these communities of 150,000 physicians, and I talk to people all the time about what their struggles are. And it's funny because people can look so put together on the surface, and then there can be so much going on underneath. And, and I realize that because I see what kind of my family dealt with and um, with in regards to my brother and what battles I think they're still fighting um, uh, on a daily basis. So in that way, I think it's prepared me to be a good leader in that I, I do try to put myself in the other person's shoes. And I don't automatically, I see sometimes um, with some of my colleagues, they'll get really frustrated if somebody does something wrong and think that the person's incompetent or this and that. And I'm just kind of like, well, let's take a step back and try to like see this from their perspective. Um, and where could we have been clearer with our directions and where could we be more intentional about how we decide who's asked to do what, right? Um, so I think that that's really important um, in terms of how I get in my own way in that regard is sometimes I'm too independent, right? Um, and sometimes I have to tell myself, like teams work for a reason and you can't be in control of everything and you can't, um, you know, and people are going to do things in ways that are different from you and like, you know, it's good to be independent, it's good to be opinionated, but also you have to step back and listen. Um, and I didn't do a whole lot of stepping back and listening when I was growing up because I just kind of did my thing um, and and nobody really made me listen to them. So um, that's kind of one thing that I have to um, remind myself a lot is like, you know, there's not only one way of doing things, you've always done it your way, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't learn from the ways around you um, and, and take a step back and listen to what other people are doing and why they're doing it. You may learn something, so. Great, thank you. Maxine, you alluded to this in your opening comments about what you learned from your family, from your culture, but tell us more about what are those strong things and what do you have to quiet? Well, I was very fortunate in that I grew up in a family that um, my my uncle lived with us. I say he's the first feminist I ever met. He he I'm the youngest of all of the cousins by many years. My older brother is ten years older than I am, and you know I knew education was extremely important in my family. And so to make everybody happy, I would really work hard. I always wanted. To, perfection. And um, my uncle would tell me, Maxine, you don't always have to get 100. You know, we just want you to work your hardest. That's the important lesson. So I felt that was a really important lesson when I was going through school, because, um, you know, to so many of my friends, the grades were more important than what they learned. So in our house, it was the effort that went in that was important. But my uncle and my my parents always encouraged me to um, do what what I wanted to do. Um, although my uncle would have preferred that I became a lawyer because um, I have about five cousins who are attorneys and two uncles that are attorneys. Um, but my parents hadn't gone to college. So I just felt I had to do well because, you know, I knew how important it was since they were not able to to you know, go to college. My mother didn't have a high school diploma. Her mother died very young. But the, the thing that was special in our house growing up was that I was told there were no limits to what I could do. Um, my problem and the thing that I have to quiet though is I've always been very impatient. You know, I, I like, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. I like things done a certain way. Um, you know, it was almost like I was an only child for 10 years of my life since my brother had gone off to college. And um, I was used to sort of having things my way. So I have to make it a, a really good effort at times um, 
to bite my tongue and to wait um, and try to encourage others to do their best work. Um, because it, it can be very easy for me to um, rush to judgment. And that has been something I have had to, for my whole life, um, remind myself that not everybody was raised in the same environment I was and um, that people come to things in different ways. It's not, it's not just my way. Um, but I tell the story that my uncle who wanted me to be a lawyer actually told me that he wanted me to be a lawyer and he wanted me to be the first female judge in our county. Now this goes back a long time. And, um, you know, I think that message was just so uh, important to me in terms of um, the confidence that I've always had. The, the other funny story is, you know, I grew up in a different era. So I was running for class president and stuff, you know, in third grade. And the boys would refer to me as, you know, either a bossy girl or um, a pushy girl. And I had to get over that because I didn't care. I thought I could do a better job than they could. So I was willing to put myself out there. And I tell, um, I tell my daughters, you can be whatever you want. You can do whatever you want. Speak up when you know that you're on the side of right. And I got that from my family. And I, I see that my daughters have, um, you know, really absorbed that, that, that way of thinking. And I'm really proud of, of who they've become. Fabulous. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, let's go on to our next question. And this one we're going to ask Nisha to take the lead in. And the question is really about how we bring up or foster the development of each other. Um, you know, uh, Madeline Albright, who died last week, had a saying that we've all heard so many times that there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. And we know that in, in order to be successful and confident and comfortable in our work as leaders, that we have to rely on each other. So conventional wisdom supported by data and numerous personal examples tells us that women are great at asking and advocating for others, but not so great when it comes to advocating for ourselves. Valerie Jarrett, uh, the influential senior advisor to President Obama, said about this issue, women are their own worst enemy. Somehow it's unseemly for women to promote themselves. We think there's a meritocracy that's hierarchical and the people on the top make the decisions about what promotions are based on. Jarrett says that as a female and as an African-American woman, she always expected to find obstacles in the workplace. She said, my parents raised me to think because I was a girl and because I was black, I was going to have to work twice as hard and that's what she did. I felt that if I was deserving, then my boss would recognize that I was deserving. Jarrett described an experience she had when she worked in the real estate division of the city of Chicago's Department of Law. Her female mentor, Lucille Dobbins, said to her, you are doing more work than your supervisor and your supervisor's supervisor, and you should be a deputy. Jarrett protested that her boss knew what she was doing and that he values my work, to which Dobbins replied, you can't sit around waiting for people to recognize your work. You have to ask for it. You need to go in there tell him you should be a deputy, and you tell him that you want to be in the front suite of offices because he doesn't have a woman in the front suite. Despite thinking that that was absolutely horrible advice, Jared mustered her courage, believing that her boss would humiliate her and tell her to get out of the office. She said, this is the work I'm doing, this is the level of complexity, and I think I should be a deputy. He looked at me and said, okay. Jarrett got the promotion in the front office and we know the rest. So the question, Nisha, is how do you advocate for yourself? Tell us about who coached you and advocated for you and what that meant to you. And how do you coach other women in your profession to advocate for themselves? Yeah, that's such a great question because we all look for mentors in different places and sometimes you find them in the most unexpected places. Yeah, that's true. Um, and it's funny because for me, you know, what we talked about 
a little bit what you alluded to earlier about sometimes women not being each other's best advocates. Um, the mentor that probably taught me the most to stand up for myself was actually a white male, um, which was really interesting for me. But, you know, he kind of said to me, like, you know what you want. You're incredibly smart. You deserve this position or you deserve this promotion or you deserve really whatever you want. And you just have to get out there and ask for it. And it was sort of the same thing where I felt like, you know, I had all these things that I was trying to battle stereotypes against, right? It was, okay, I'm a woman. I decided to have children early. I've got young children. I'm in a male dominated department. You know, I've got to prove to people that I can do everything that they can do. And the truth was, is I didn't really need to to prove that I could do what they could do because I was doing what they were doing and I was doing more of it, right? Um, and so it took a while for me to really realize what it meant to know my worth. And um, that is something that now I tell yeah. every woman, like know your worth, um, understand that you have a set of skills that you know is uniquely you and you need to be able to advocate for those skills and tell people like, this is why you want me here at this table. Um, and if you don't toot that horn and you rely on somebody else to toot that horn, most times nobody's going to do it um, for one reason or the other. And it's not that they're bad people. It's not that they want you not to succeed. It's just nobody's going to advocate for yourself the way that you advocate for yourself. And that's something I think as females, we just don't do as well. And there's been obviously lots of data to substantiate how women negotiate at negotiating tables and things like that. And now um, I, I mean, I negotiate hard and I am ruthless with my negotiations. And I actually like really recognize the fact that I have a lot of things going in my favor that my male colleagues actually don't have going in their favor, right? Um, which is interesting because sometimes you look at things um, and you see how is this working against you and you don't look at how is this working for you actually. So, you know, in my case, I do have the ability to walk away from the table, right? 70 to 80% of female physicians are married to other high income professionals. And in the worst case scenario, if I walked away, I have the means to be able to be off for three or four months. Um, and, and that would be okay. And that's not to say that I want that outcome, but it does allow me some negotiating power. And so maybe that is a situation in which I say like, hey, I, I don't wanna do this. And here's the reasons why I don't wanna do this, or I deserve to do this. And here's the reasons why I deserve it. And if you don't let me do it, maybe that's a deal breaker for me. So, you know, I once had a job negotiation where it, it was really being used against me um, that my husband was in a particular position and they were like, well, she's never going to leave because her husband is grounded here. And, you know, he's the primary breadwinner. He's the plastic surgeon. She's the radiologist. He makes more than she does. Like she's never going to leave. Um, and so they perfectly like accordingly lowballed my offer. And I knew what other people were being offered and I knew I was being lowballed. And, you know, I kind of looked at them and turned it around on them and said, you're right. Like, I don't actually need this job. Um, and just as much as you think that I like don't have other options, I can also, I also have the option to not take this job. And I can't come to work every day knowing that I am getting paid less than everybody else who is doing less than what I do, have less qualifications than I have. If it means that I'm without a job for a few months while I find a teleradiology position, then so be it. But I'm walking out of this room right now. And I knew that their business plan depended on me being there because I had a unique set of skills that nobody else in the department had. Um, and I knew that they were going to give me whatever I wanted. It just took me the courage to say that I was going to walk away um, and, and to really emphasize the strengths that I had that I knew that nobody else had. And I said to them, good luck finding somebody with this set of skills. Obviously, I said it in a much nicer way. I think there is a way that you approach negotiations. Um, and I said it in a way that was much more tactful. But at the end of the day, that's what I told them. I basically challenged them to find somebody who could replace me um, at even a fraction of the price that they were getting me at, even if they did up their offer to meet everybody else. And, you know, 10 minutes later, I had the offer in my hand that I wanted. And, and that was that. But it took me a little bit of time to really like flip those things in my favor. And now, um, you know, I very routinely in all of my negotiations kind of say, like, if I don't need something, I, I will actually say, you know, that I would love for this to happen, but I'm willing to walk away from this table. Um, and usually the person on the other side of the table is actually not willing to walk away because I know that like that skill set that I have or that, you know, whatever it is that I bring to the table is unique. And, and most of the times I'll get it, but 
yeah, I think for me, really advocating for myself has been really understanding and knowing the worth that I bring to the table and, and learning how to ask for it. Um, and I, I tell people that male or female all the time now, um, you know, I say to people like, you have a set of skills, I think, especially for healthcare workers who are constantly dealing with administration and, you know, people trying to cut costs and things like that. I think it's really important that healthcare workers remind those people um, exactly how, I mean, they can't do their jobs without us. And, and until we can step up and say, hey, this is what we need to be successful and this is what we need to give good care to our patients. Um, and we advocate for ourselves, for our patients, and, and really for policy as a whole in terms of healthcare policy. Um, if we don't take that step, nobody will. So really important. And that's something that I emphasize to people that I interact with every day is know your worth and ask for it. Thank you. Nisha Maxine, what's your take on this subject? Well, you know, I think that Nisha said, uh, said so much uh, so well, but, you know, I think that it's really, um, important to be willing to stand up for yourself. You know, I, I got out of dental school. I did a year of anesthesia training before I did my perio training and um, somebody offered me a job and, you know, it was remarkably less than my male colleagues were making. And I said to the man, I, I can't possibly take this job. I mean, it's just not, um, you're not offering me an adequate salary. And he said to me, you should be grateful I'm offering your job, you're a girl. And I hadn't been called a girl in a long time, um, but it was from there on that I knew that, um, you know, I had to stand up for myself. And part of the reason I went into private practice was the job market for women dentists um, in the early 1980s was just terrible. Um, you know, aside from just offering us less money, the questions they would ask us at interviews um, were just, are, are illegal to ask today. And we're yeah. probably illegal even then. So, and they're still asking them. <laughs> you know, right, and, and so they are still asking them. That really makes me sad. But, but, but the thing is, um, I've always known that if I didn't value myself, um, no one else would. And that's the message that I tell dental, female dental students, young dentists, um, know your worth. Um, you offer a lot and you need to know what your male colleagues are earning and be prepared because again, I don't think women are, are raised to be great negotiators and that's really part of the problem. So I have over the years improved my negotiating skills and I'm willing to say just like Nisha, no, I'm sorry, that's just not acceptable to me. But you have to know this, you know, women dentists earn 30% less than their male colleagues. That's to me, to me, that's just appalling. But if you don't know that, um, and you're not aware, then yeah. you can't change that. So, you know, I make sure that people know that um, negotiating um, in, in the workplace is, is critically important. When I was running for president of ADA, um, you know, in, in a similar vein, um, I just like, you know, Claire uh, um, Luth, Luce Booth um, had made a great observation that she could not fail because if she failed, they wouldn't say she failed, they'd say women failed. And for the women in my, you know, in my era, in my dental school class, we always felt we had to work twice as hard, do twice you know, our work had to be that much better um, to be taken seriously. So, you know, I've always been very prepared. So when I ran for ADA president, I, I knew the issues, I had studied them, I, I had a grasp on everything. And yet one male colleague said to a group of other male colleagues, I know Maxine is the smartest person running and the most knowledgeable, but does she look presidential? And you know what I tell young women, go home, look in the mirror, because that is what presidential looks like. That's great. You know, make your own, you know, in my mind, um, women who have a lot to offer and want to be involved, they all look presidential to me. And it's not about wearing a Brooks Brothers suit or having a pair of, um, you know, uh, a certain, you know, church shoes. You know, women 
can decide what's best for them and what makes them presidential. And every, every woman dentist that I meet, I believe has the potential to be presidential. Wow, thank you. Nat Natalia, what do you think about this? How, how do you advocate for yourself and how do you encourage young women that you're in contact with to do that for themselves? So many thoughts on this topic, wow. Where do I begin? So I think, you know, as a nurse leader, I've learned from the best in terms of strategizing and amplifying our voices. You know, my hope is that one day women will become more CEOs, more CMOs, and more CFOs. Uh, you know, so amplifying one another's voice has been essential to success in many meetings where I've sat. And we've literally talked about the Barack Obama administration when women had to do that which is literally reiterate the same thing the other woman just said to be heard. And that's, and that's hard. I have a lot of mentors. One mentor of mine right now was named the most powerful woman in Canada. And she really taught me a lot of great tricks in terms of what should happen before the meeting, after the meeting. And it's not easy. And I think it does require some strategy. As a black woman, where you know, black women are literally 7.8% of, of all nurses, it's difficult. So what I've learned is the importance of also not just saying something, because anyone who knows me knows that I'm not afraid to express myself and I'm bold and I'm brave, but I've learned the importance of the window of opportunity to say something. So sometimes you don't really have to yeah. say it right then and then, then and now, and you can just wait. And the power of waiting has just been remarkable in my life, where someone literally just asked me, how long have you been thinking about? And I said, six months, six to 10 months, and they were shocked. But sometimes you have to wait for the window of opportunity to really speak your mind. And as a black woman, I can't help but think about the stereotypes. I think Nisha you know, intimated or alluded to the stereotypes that we often face around the angry black woman or the person who is abrasive. And I've had to really temper that and to really think about how do I express myself where it resonates on the other side. And so I'm very strategic in my approach. I'm not erratic or reactive. You know, I process things, um, whether it's a one-on-one -on -one expression where the individual really hear me, um, mm -hmm. as opposed to saying it in an open forum. Yes. Um, those are the, the strategies and the tools that I've had to really work on along the way. But I, I certainly implore my mentees to express themselves um, I think it's really important that we do. Even other executives, I've had to say, you have to say something. That's what leadership is. Like you can't just see that there's a problem and you're not saying anything. Yes. At the end of the day, um, I'm also cognizant of the environment for self-advocacy, right? In terms of where do I work? Will they respect me as a woman? Will they respect me as a black woman? Is this an environment that is conducive uh, to my success. And so those are all of the things I've had uh, to think about because it's not just saying something or speaking up, it's whether or not you're really included in the conversation, whether or not what you're saying holds any weight and um, whether or not you will have an impact. And to me, that's more important than just being heard is whether or not the individual or the individuals are really listening. Oh, such great, such great thoughts, such great comments, and, and so, so important. So our last question, before we ask our audience to join us in this conversation, oh, has to do... Can I, can I just chime in with one more thing? Yes, um, of course. Um, I just wanted to add also that a big part of advocating for yourself is also trying to figure out how to get other people to advocate for you. Um, and so one thing that comes up a lot, for example, is, um, you know, a lot of men feel that the gender gap is not their problem, right? Like, I'm making what I'm making it's all good, right? Like they can fight that battle on their own. And what I like to do whenever I see, you know, I do a lot of public speaking on this topic and we'll always have the men kind of just be like, oh yeah, that doesn't really exist at my institution. My institution doesn't do that. My group doesn't do that, whatever. And I say to them, you know, you may not think that the gender gap applies to you, 
But in an environment right now where everybody's salaries are being based off of MGMA and collective data and 33% of the female physician population is systematically being underpaid, what do you think that that does to your data in terms of skewing the numbers? So you think this doesn't affect you, but actually it is the reason why you are also getting paid less. And the minute that you put it in those words for them, right? Like they have nothing to lose if I make more money. They just never really cared if I made more money, right? But now all of a sudden they've got a stake at the table and they're also advocating for salary transparency. And they're saying, hey, Nisha, like I make this much and like you, you know, you should make X amount too, because everybody does, you know, and, and convincing those people who are not advocating for you that they should be advocating for you is a really powerful way to advocate for yourself as well. Because as a woman, you are going to find yourself as the minority in a lot of these professional um, sec sectors. And as Natalia said, like you, sometimes you're waiting for that place where you can say the right thing. And maybe it's not that you're saying the right thing, you're prepping somebody else to say the right thing in that right moment. Um, and so it's so important to like get everybody on board um, for why they should be helping you out so that you're not the angry person. You're not the person who's like the only one fighting a certain battle. You really want to bring other people into your battle. Um, and I think that that's really important. All right. I'm gonna Thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Okay, Maxine, we're going to ask you if you will be, um, be good enough to lead our answer to this next and final question. And then at Nisha and Natalia will join in. So in a San Francisco federal court, the Communication Workers of America Union filed a class action suit against some of the country's largest employers, including Amazon, T-Mobile, Capital One, and Enterprise Rent-A-Car, accusing them of deliberately targeting their Facebook ads to exclude older workers. A ProPublica investigation showed that IBM has quietly pushed out upwards of 20,000 aging workers over the past five years. And for all that has been written about the woeful lack of diversity and the bro culture that prevail in the tech industry, Silicon Valley's 150 biggest tech companies have faced more accusations of age bias over the past decade than racial or gender bias. Although the Age Discrimination Employment Act of 1967 produces, uh, prohibits discrimination against people 40 and older, a recent survey by AARP showed that two-thirds of workers between the ages of 45 and 74 say they have seen or experienced ageism. The situation has been worse for women. Sheep. Researchers, oh, am I doing this? Okay. Researchers Athena uh, Macro and Andrea Gallant reviewed books, articles, and websites that provided advice to women wanting to succeed in the workplace. In a paper entitled Stepford Women in the Workplace in the Harvard Business Review 2012, uh, she said the cardinal advice they found was this. The right look and the corporate appearance affording familiarity and respect. Uh, be attractive as you grow older. Your hair should be cut shorter as it conveys professionalism. I mean, this is like what people really said. But things are changing. Forbes magazine has recently launched its 50 over 50 initiative to emphasize that growing older is about getting wiser, older, and highlighted an inaugural class of female entrepreneurs, leaders, and creators all over 50 years of age who are part of an exhilarating movement, redefining life's second half and proving that success has no age limit. And there were so many people who applied or gave, uh, wanted to be in that 50 over 50 group that they started a 60 over 60 group of great achievers and then a 70 over 70 group. So, my question, Maxine, is how can we help women see that we have a long runway in our careers, that many women are doing their best and most interesting work in their 50s, 60s, and beyond, so that we can assure younger women 
that they don't have to accomplish everything by the time they're 30. How do we combat the ageism which seems to affect women more than men? Well, you know, I think that's a great question. Um, in my profession, the beauty of dentistry and, and the thing that I think appealed to so many women, especially, uh, you know, in my era and a few years later is dentistry is a very fluid profession. So, you know, I think we need to tell young women that um, it's okay to get on and off the, the, the highway um, at different stages in their life that you know, for example, when I first started, I, I taught and, and then I opened my practice and it was a little difficult. So I gave up teaching. Now I teach one day a month at a residency program. Um, I've gotten involved in a company that is looking at um, artificial intelligence in terms of looking at dental radiographs. The point is, I think we need to make it clear from the beginning that that you have the right to define your own success in your profession. And what might be success for one person might not be the definition of success for another. And that the beauty of being professional women is that there are many opportunities that exist for us throughout our career. But I think we have to let people know that for example, in academia, less than 20% of the dental school deans are women, and yet 50% of the class are female. So we need to start promoting mid-career dentists uh, who have tremendous yeah. e experience and knowledge um, and give them the skills they need so that they can um, rise up in, let's say, academia, because right now the opportunities don't exist for them. Um, we, you know, I'm on the board of um, a foundation. It's called the Gillette Hayden Foundation. She was a woman who um, was like a maverick in dentistry um, back in the, you know, 1800s and the beginning of uh, the 1900s. Um, and what we're doing is we're giving scholarships to women uh, in academia who want to learn how to improve their leadership skills so that they can um, move up the ladder. Um, I, we are also giving scholarships to practitioners who want to improve their business skills. Um, again, I think it's about educating and promoting women at all levels um, of their career, at all stages of their career, um, and, and, and bringing attention to the fact that there are disparities and that we need to fix these disparities. Yeah and that women in their 50s and 60s and 70s in our professions still have tremendous um, knowledge and expertise and care that, that they can offer. Um, and so I think that, for example, there is a 10 under 10 that the American Dental Association Awards give out for um, dentists who are under, you know, out of practice less than 10 years. I think it would be great to do a 50 over 50 or mm -hmm. 60 over 60, because I know a lot of very talented women dentists who should be recognized for their contributions, whether it be in the business world, um, doing research. Um, and so again, I think it's about education and uh, promoting um, those of us who are um, more mid to late career uh, practitioners. And, and that, and, and I think it's a great idea. I love the 50 over 50 and the 60 over 60. Yes, I, I do too. And, uh, I, and I absolutely believe that there is truth and that in, in your later years, all kinds of things become possible that just weren't possible in those early days. Natalia, what do you think about this issue? How do we, how do we help women see the long picture that it doesn't all have to happen by age 30, 35, especially in our profession where, you know, we, we retention issues are, are things that we deal with. Right, from a nursing perspective, I think 
we do not do enough of tapping into our retirees. So most recently we started a mentorship program where we're bringing back retiree nurses who've left with all of this amazing knowledge to contribute to new nurses and creating that bridge. I think we have to do yeah. more of that. As a culture and society, I think we have the wrong priorities in terms of, I'm just thinking of it from a beauty perspective. Um, you know, I, I, Haley Berry, Michelle Obama, I think of so many amazing older women who just don't really get the attention they should. You know, there's so much focus on your 20s, your 30s. Um, you know, I, I, and I also think about mammograms or menopause, you know, the, the horrific stories we hear, the pain. Um, and not only sometimes it's not that painful, but I don't think there's enough of knowledge sharing between generations in general, whether that's in the workplace or in life itself. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for older women to teach younger women. With mm -hmm. that being said, I think there's a lot of pressure of women in their 20s, young women, uh, to succeed so quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, we just have to slow down a little bit. I think when you do that, uh, I see a lot of individuals that are not necessarily well balanced. And so they, they have amazing careers, but there's social isolation. Um, and, you know, they suffer from mental health issues in different ways. So I think there's a lot that we have to do to really um, give praise to women who are older in their 50s, 60s, 70s, who are beautiful and do not need short haircuts. Um, and also um, to really do a lot more sharing, again, whether it's every day or in the workplace, which is what we're doing at New York City Health and Hospital. Great. Nisha, what do you think about this issue of sort of spacing it out, looking looking long and broadly. Um, I mean, I think Maxine and Natalia brought up a lot of really great points. I guess just to add to what they've already said, um, the other thing to keep in mind is that every, every season of your career, I mean, there are different seasons of your career, right? So what you do during one stage of your life doesn't have to be what you do in another stage of your life. And I think that our male colleagues sort of have more opportunities to reinvent themselves um, or to pivot um, that, that feel sometimes inaccessible to us as females because we're, we're balancing so much on, in our personal lives. And I know for me, you know, my thirties were really about, yes, building my career, but then every minute that wasn't building my career was also, you know, raising my children and making sure that they had the foundation that I wanted and supporting my husband's career. And, you know, really a large part of those like years felt as though it was this act of survival to just do that, right? Like there was no time for me um, to figure out like when I would read a book for fun or when I would take a class for fun or when I would learn something for fun. And in the meantime, my male colleagues were out there getting MBAs or, you know, doing all these other extra things. And, and then what happens is you perpetuate that system, right? Because they go to business school, they meet with all the other people, they perpetuate this like old boys club and everybody's cross promoting each other. And, and that's a lot of times where the women get left behind because they're not out there networking and they're not out there being able to share their, um, you know, to learn and build up these other skills. So for me, the big thing that I think is so important is number one, telling females to make sure that they prioritize their um, interests. And, and, you know, maybe it's not two hours a day that you can find to do something, but find you know, 15 minutes a day to read about something yeah. or read about something that's different and make sure that you take advantage of opportunities to network. And really when you run into somebody who feels like they want to mentor you, make the time to talk to that person and mentor those people. Because I do feel like there are a lot of females at later stages in their careers that have learned all this stuff and are so eager to impart that knowledge. And then the younger females are actually not in a position to receive that knowledge because they have so much on their plate, right? So I always tell people, if you see people wanting to teach you and wanting to take you under their wings, like do not pass up that opportunity. Don't hide under the, I'm too busy, like find a way to make that happen. Right. Because I will tell you, like, I laugh at my husband all the time. And I know this is my fault, but like, if he wants to go to the gym, he will find a way to go to the gym. And I just don't do that. Right. Like if I've got other things going on, I'm like, okay, fine. Like I'll do this another time. But somehow, like if he wants to listen to a podcast or if he wants to go to the gym or if you like, the world just magically opens up to create space for him. But I think I like, 
I just always put everybody else's needs above. And I forget to say like, this is my carved out time for myself to learn X, Y, and Z or to do X, Y, and Z. And so as I've gotten older, I've become a lot more intentional because otherwise I'm just resentful about it, right? So I've told myself like, it's actually better for you to set boundaries and say, I'm going to, I'm going to prioritize this and I'm going to make it a thing because otherwise I'm going to be resentful that I didn't get to do something that somebody else got to do. And so I've got to find a way to make that happen. Um, I think we all struggle with so much guilt um, in regards to all the things that we're trying to balance that sometimes like women in general just have more of that guilt and, and telling yourself it's okay to like make that time for yourself to pursue those things and realizing that the world will not come crashing down if you take 15 minutes out of your day um, is really, really important. I think your comments are, all these comments are really wonderful. And I just want to reinforce something you said, Nisha, as a woman who is an older woman and a professional woman, one of the joys of being at this place in my life is to be able to give back and to share everything I've learned, all the mistakes I've made, everything I've gotten right. And, and uh, that's one of the joys of teaching, to watch these young women and men you know, develop uh, as sort of shaky, uh, in the beginning and then watch them develop into young leaders. It, it, it's a joy and a privilege. So I think you make a really good point. All these young women should be looking for us, older women, to help them think through what's happening. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really powerful when somebody says to you, you know what, I made every effort to make sure that I was doing X, Y, and Z for my children. And 20 years later, I realized it didn't matter. And like, I, I like stressed myself out to no end to do this one thing and it would have been okay. And kind of trying to put that in perspective and being like, okay, well, like my children will survive. They are evolutionarily built to survive. And if I don't make it to this one thing, the, the world is not gonna come crashing down. Um, but I, you, you, like as a mother, you have such a hard time telling yourself that. So when somebody else that has been through that pathway can look back and say, you know, 20 years later, this did not make a difference. This did make a difference. So make sure yes. you prioritize this, but this did not make a difference and just take it off your plate. Um, yes, and that's, that is great. We have a couple of questions from our audience and we have a little bit of time. So let's see what people are wanting to know. Okay, here's a question and we'll ask all three of you to respond. As women, what has been the greatest challenge in achieving your success in your role? Natalia, let's start with you. The greatest challenge in achieving success. Hmm. That's a good question. I think, I don't wanna just make up an answer. I feel like I've really been fortunate to really achieve success. I would say, I would say, finding individuals, male or female, that work as hard as I do for the mission. Um, there are a lot of people who have not been invested in really caring for the underserved and just want a title or just uh, want to work on my team, but they're not really committed. Um, and so I think commitment has been the hardest thing to find in individuals, but I've been very fortunate to have the best bosses, to work at the best organizations and to have the best experience and education. So um, no significant challenges yet, I must say. Okay, Maxine, is there a particular thing that was especially challenging for you as, as you have achieved this place um, in yeah. your life? I, I think that, you know, it was challenging at first because, again, um, there were so few women um, in my profession when I started that, um, you know, people would look at you a bit askew, you know, like my, I had um, committed to be a committee chairperson and they were having a meeting of my component dental society in June and I showed up and everybody and I had delivered my daughter in April. So people said to me, what are you doing here? I said, well, you know, I'm the committee chair of such and such. I mean, I have to be at this meeting. And they said to me, interestingly enough, well, we didn't think you were going to keep, you know, keep working. And I was like, what? Mm -hmm. um, I made a commitment. And when I make a commitment, I keep it. But 
you know, in the end, I think the thing that's really helped my success is I have developed um, with great difficulty at times, a great network of colleagues um, in and out of dentistry, um, people that I can depend on, um, people who trust me and my judgment. Um, many of them, most of them, you know, over the years were males because there were, again, there weren't many women to network with as um, Nisha had pointed out. And that's one of the things I've been working on for the last number of years is trying to improve networking opportunities for young women because, you know, A, I don't play golf. B, I don't hang out in the bar, you know, with my male colleagues at various meetings. And most of my female colleagues don't. So I've had to develop a network outside of what was the mm -hmm. original network. And that's been my greatest help, I think, in my success. Nisha, have you uh, found anything to be particularly challenging? I mean, you've talked about some of the important things that you've learned and some of the important stands that you take and how you learn to do that. But has anything been particularly challenging for you in your career? I mean, I think sometimes it's learning to get out of your own way. <laughs> um, and yeah, I, I, I agree with you there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there are so many um, preconceived notions um, that you have about what other people are going to think about what you do and then whatever insecurities you all that you have yourself that you place on your shoulders and your own imposter syndrome and you know all of those sorts of things become really prevalent for females when they're thinking about making major moves or going against the grain and for me it's really um, you know so many times I, I think and I think and I think about how I'm going to do what it is that I've want to do um, instead of just doing it. And I don't see that hesitation with certain other people and, and it's just part of who I am. So I kind of have to fight against my gut instinct to say like, you know, you know, what is my mentor X going to think if I do Y or what is, um, you know, am I, am I sending a message to the universe that I don't care about X if I pass up on this opportunity for reason Y. And, you know, there's a lot of that stuff where you just kind of need to own your identity and, and what it is that you want and sort of say, the rest of the world doesn't matter. This is what I'm going to do. And I think now I've gotten to a point where I'm good at that 90% of the time, but there's still 10% uh -huh. of the time where I tell myself like, mm, maybe you want to think about that a little bit. And maybe part of that is good, right? You don't want to be reckless, but also I, I do think that sometimes I get in my own way. Okay, here's another question from uh, a member of our audience. How did you find a mentor in your profession, especially for students and recent graduates? Uh, do you find a mentor through a program or network, networking? What worked for you? And think about someone who was especially influential in your life. Um, Natalia, let's start with you. Sure. So um, I've been fortunate enough to be in programs where mentors were assigned. So I would say formally and informally. Sometimes uh, I might find an individual that gives really good advice and I continue to call that individual and I make them a mentor. Um, I've had bosses at, as mentors and I, I have a, a rule of thumb, always report to someone who can mentor you, right? If, if you can't contribute to my professional development, I'm probably not challenged and I probably will not work for you. Um, so that's just something that I always do. But um, right now I've got two mentors who are just phenomenal. One lives in Israel and we're constantly on WhatsApp, um, giving her updates and conversing or meeting um, when she's in town. But um, I make it a point to always have a mentor. I think they're instrumental. So whether or not uh, it's someone that you can trust and confide in, you know, um, at your weakest point or just someone that continues to pour into you um, really good advice and to see the best in you is something that um, I, I believe in strongly. Just yesterday, you know, I, I gave her an update. Um, so I think that I have had up to, I would say seven mentors, some that I do not communicate with anymore, um, but for different periods within my career, I've had mm -hmm. to switch um, based on their level of expertise. And they're not always nurses and they're not always women um, and they're not always a black or brown. You know, sometimes majority of my mentors have been Caucasian, ironically. Um, so it doesn't really matter to me as long as you're contributing to making me a better professional and a better human being. But I would say definitely get a mentor, get a sponsor, get someone who's really 
um, invested in your development. Yes, absolutely. It's totally critical. Maxine, what advice do you have for young people who are searching for a mentor? I, I tell people I, I have been blessed my entire academic career and professional career with amazing mentors. Many of them were men. You know, I think one of my earliest mentors was when I was an undergraduate at NYU, Jay Oliva, who went on to become the president of, um, you know, NYU, saw something in me and and took me under his wing. And I mm -hmm. learned so much about, um, you know, how to, how to interact with people, how to listen, um, and how to make my voice heard. One of one of the most important mentors I had was one of my professors in dental school who I eventually went to work for in the early part of my career, Milt Martin, who um, got me involved in organized dentistry and um, really told me that um, I had great opinions and ideas and I could always go to Milt for advice. Um, even now today, I'm 65 years old and I still have mentors. People mm -hmm. that um, absolutely, you know, maybe are more confidants, but who are more seasoned than myself in many things. Uh, my friend Herb Delinsky, when I have a question, um, I don't hesitate to call and get his advice. Uh, my classmate, Alan Friedel, who um, I call on a regular basis to run things by because, you know, sometimes you think your idea is great and maybe it's not as great as you think. But I tell people that. Um, people, I try to mentor people and I always tell people, feel free to call me. I give people my, my email address, my phone number. You know, most people I believe are touched and, and feel privileged to act as someone's mentor. Mm -hmm. So what I tell people is if you see traits in someone, traits that you admire, traits that you would like to emulate, um, knowledge that someone has that you would like to know more about, uh, send an email, pick up a phone. Most yes. people are really glad yes. to act as a mentor. So um, I've always seen it as a privilege and um, I enjoy mentoring uh, younger women. Nisha, what do you think about this? How do you, how do you seek out mentors? What advice do you have for younger colleagues who might be wondering how to do that? Yeah, I mean, I would echo the last part of what Maxine said and, and part of the first part about what Natalia said in, in that, you know, your mentors, for me, like I seek mentorship in every conversation that I have. Um, I try to be really intentional about when I schedule a meeting with somebody before I talk to them, I know what I want to get out of that meeting. I know what, you know, what part of the reason that I asked for that meeting that I was hoping to learn something from. And I'm not shy about asking those questions. I really try to be intentional about like, if I'm connecting with somebody, they're taking time out of their day to talk to me. I'm taking time out of my day to talk to them. I want to make sure that this, this interaction has meaning. Yeah. So, um, I really, if I see something about somebody that I admire, I could not admire 15 other things or, you know, those things might just not relate to me and that's okay. Like I find the thing that relates to me or exactly what I'm trying to do. And then I try to get as much information from them as I can on that thing. Um, and along the lines of what Maxine was saying, like, don't be shy about reaching out to people. I think so often people are so flattered to be asked a question. Um, and so I really feel as though my big thing is, okay, like I used to be shy about are, you know, how are they going to feel if I reach out to them out of the blue to ask them about X, Y, and Z? And I realized, well, the worst thing they're going to do is ignore my email, right? Like that's, that's really the worst thing that's going to happen. So, um, you know, I, I just send the email and I say, Hey, I'd love five minutes of your time. And the other thing I would say is to be very direct in your email about why you're looking to talk to them. Because I will tell you as somebody who gets like a lot of emails asking for mentorship or somebody, you know, a lot of people asking for time to talk to me, the ones that are very vague, that's a harder yes for me to make time mm -hmm. for because like, it's just, it's very hard if somebody's like, well, hey, I want to talk to you about all things in my life. Like my life is kind of crazy right now. I want to talk about things. I'm kind of like, oh, that, that could be a really long conversation. And I, I have to think about when I can find time for that. But if somebody says to me, hey, like, 
these are the things that I'm learning or I really want to learn about. And the more that you can put very succinctly, because nobody has time these days, but the more that you can say, like, this is what I want to talk to you about, the more that person can say, hey, I'm the right person to talk to you about. And I would love to tell you X, Y, and Z. Or they can say, you know what, actually, I don't know that much about that, but you should talk to so-and-so and they may make a little warm connection. To yes. So the more direct you are with your asks and your intention about why you're connecting with somebody, the more likely you are to get that meaning out of that interaction. Well, needless to say, we could go on all night with this conversation and maybe we'll do it again at some point in the not terribly distant future. But I want to thank Dr. Natalia Senius, Dr. Maxine Feinberg and Dr. Nisha Mehta for spending this evening with us. We're so grateful that you made time in your busy days to spend time with us and thank you. And thank you to all our participants. We hope that this was really an enjoyable evening for you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't know. Are right, Daisy, are you there, Janet? I'm here. Okay, how did it go? It went good. Thank you for doing closing remarks.